operation is about 50% row crops, irrigated row crops, and 50% rangeland. We're in southwest Missouri, uh, about halfway between Joplin and Springfield, and we're on the edge of the Ozark Plateau. This is where the, the Ozarks meet the prairie, and I've been fortunate to grow up among a lot of prairie remnant prairies that were salvaged. What we're seeing when we, when we rehab the native warm season grass fields is the increase in diversity, especially in the native pastures. We have a few hundred acres that we've been able to rehabilitate and we use practices like chemical and uh, grazing methods to uh, remove the fescue or non-native cool season species, which has basically infected every, every bit of forage in, in, in Missouri. When you remove the fescue effect, uh, the diversity just really expands and explodes in those fields. When we really did a good job of uh, suppressing the fescue and uh, proper burning and grazing control, the botanists checked the field on the east side of this place and they measured 40 new species in uh, one of our native pastures. That diversity just makes sense. That's another thing. It's just like looking at the improvement in the soil structure and the intake. It, it just makes all the sense in the world that a diverse uh, group of plants growing is going to be more resilient and more stable than uh, you know, just monocultures. The neat thing is, is uh, uh, putting together these properties where we had pastures adjacent to row crops. Didn't realize how good it would dovetail with the grazing of cover crops on the row crop acres, and it's dovetailing nicely. The grazing animals on the native warm season pastures back in the day they were eating this diverse diet, and they instinctively knew what forbs to take a mouthful in relationship to the grass grazing. And what we've seen on our cattle herd is very good health without hardly any antibiotic use. On the animals we sell for food, we, we don't use antibiotics in the herd at all, and uh, we use no hormones or anything. And we just have unusually healthy animals. The cattle are the are the uh, the method of evening out the fields just by their bodily functions going back over the field and the way they graze being such a supreme device to level the the field out so to speak to redistribute nutrients. Every new native plant I see, I I take a picture. I go home and open up my book and find out what species it is and. What it, where it likes to grow, sure as heck, it's growing in the spot it likes to grow in, you know. The real world has to be utilized to work. You just can't take a piece of property and set it away like a picture and it's going to stay. It's got to be utilized in the way it evolved to be utilized by, which on the, these prairies is having the grazing animals be part of it. All this dates back to how the prairies were formed and built soil. They literally built soil. And the way they did it was uh, uh, with the, from a diverse plant mix and the hooved animals, the, the herds of bison and wildlife, that combination is what made these soils. The only way to learn about native warm season grasses is to just do it. Put it, there's so many programs that are almost low cost or no cost to try. A buffer strip, a, a, a corner. We get a lot of help from MDC, private lands people, NRCS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. There's nothing radical about what we're doing. It's common sense things and it's training yourself to really observe and learn what's going on. Animals have been, in my opinion, they're the missing link to advance our soil. I'm a farmer from Southwest Missouri. We farm around 880 acres of row crop ground. We also have about another 128 acres of pasture land. 
on our cattle operation. All we really have is a four-wheeler, um, some poly wire, electric fence charger, and some water tanks. And that's pretty much all you need to run that system. What we use is adaptive multi-paddock grazing. Um, it's not a standard set rotation, so we don't get set on like a rotation, whether that's clockwise or counterclockwise. We're always switching on the rotation every year. We also focus more on stock density instead of stocking rate. So what that means is you can get 10, 10 cows at 100,000 pounds stock density, depending on how large the paddock size is. And that plays a lot of benefits because if you think back, you know, as we, as you know, I'm sure y'all have heard this before with like Lewis and Clark's entries about, you know, the buffalo running across the prairies and how tight knitted they were. Well, then there was long periods of rest. And so with this system here, we will run the cows tighter during certain times of year and wider other times of year, but we never get stuck in what we call a rotation. It's always adaptive. It's always moving because nature's adaptive. It changes every single day. Our system is, I think, the most based closest to how nature actually functions. If you look at the deer, how they graze, they go and graze in an area and that area might be left alone for quite a while. We do the same thing with our animals. We also don't take too much of the above ground biomass. We always leave 50 to 75% of the above ground biomass for the soil. So let's use the word holistic for a second. Everything is a whole, right? We're all connected. Everything's connected on this planet. We all are, are one, right? So um, when we look at our farm like that, I used to separate the cows from the row crops. I didn't think the two could be intertwined. But then I got to thinking about, you know, when we started custom grazing in 2018 as well, and we brought cows, other people's cows on our farm, I mean, it was just made so much sense. I already had the cover crop there regardless. So by putting those cows on there, it actually increased cash opportunities on my farm. We were no-tilling cover crop for four years before that, but the second we put the cattle on there, made the biggest difference, the animals. But not only just putting them out there, managing them out there, running them in higher stock densities, not just opening the gate and letting them run across 100 acres, managing the cattle, letting the plants have proper rest periods. So we took some cows that were in very poor, poor body condition and some young calves, and we were able to put four and a half pounds daily gain on the pairs, which is better than feedlot. The neighbor fed less hay, his cows got fed, his cows put on body condition, so that increases their value if he had to sell them. I was able to get paid. He had the manure and the urine distribution on my farm to help save on that synthetic fertilizer, so it was good for both parties. The cows can destroy ground if you let them, but if you manage them, they can actually be very beneficial to land. And, and cattle are by no means harmful to the environment. Cows are so good for the environment because as they graze and they stimulate grasses, right? When, as they graze, the, the grass then tries to collect more photosynthesis, try to regrow back. We can actually get more grass, capture more CO2 from the atmosphere, which is a good thing. We've documented over hundred different species of grasses, trees, and forbs on our farm. We have seen quite a diversity. We've actually seen uh, warm season perennial grasses come on, um, like Virginia switchgrass, big blue stem, little blue. Um, Indian grass, um, we've got gama grass in places, and none of that was ever seeded. We never seeded any of that. It just was in the natural uh, latent seed bank. It come on naturally from animal stimulating. If you look at a cow's hoof, you know, a cow's hoof is designed to stimulate the soil. It massages the soil and it pulsates the soil, and that actually creates different little seedlings to come on. So when we put cows in tighter and we pulse that ground, then we give it a long rest period, we'll actually get more of these perennial grasses or sometimes those annual forbs to come on. And that's really important. We also don't spray for anything. We have thistles in our pasture, but our cows eat them. They like to graze thistles. They like to graze mallflower roses. And the reason why they're doing that also is because all these plants have different levels of minerals in them, right? Nutrients in them. So when a cow needs to go select for iodine, she'll go pick up a thistle and she'll eat a thistle to get her iodine needs. If she needs, if there's a pigweed out there, she'll go and grab that for boron. If there's orchard grass out there, if she needs a little bit extra phosphorus, she'll go grab orchard grass. So when you have a diversity of pasture, now you don't have to feed mineral. Our cows get no mineral, no feed consumption, um, nothing like that. They literally just eat grass and have calves. That's all they do. I don't have fly issues either because we don't use insecticide. We have a healthy dung beetle population. I hope we can film that today, you know, seeing all the dung beetles out there today. You know, it's just very important that we follow nature's principles. And, and this is nature's template. You know, what we try to mimic on our farm, this is not my idea or anyone else's idea. This is just what nature gave us, you know, with the native prairies or the forest, whatever we use, you know, for biomimicry on our farm, that's what we kind of focus on. We custom graze and then we also have some of our own livestock and we wanted to be able to have good forage 
all year round. And so the cool season grasses obviously fill a spot, you know, in the spring and in the fall and, and hold better to winter graze. Uh, the warm season grasses then fill that spot in the summer. The benefit for us of moving every two days and through the rotational grazing has been kind of twofold. Obviously it's good for the grass and it's good for the livestock, but then it's a great way to, as we open the gate and they go past us, to be able to get an eye on everyone as they're going through. So it's also a great way to check herd health. When we first set up the farm in rotational grazing, we only had cattle. And so that's been a work in progress to be able to, to be prepared for hair sheep. And um, we've expanded the hair sheep thing very fast. Um, three years ago, we started with 80 and now we have 400 head of use. And so that has been an astronomical expansion <laughs> and one that we're gonna continue. Um, and so the infrastructure, you know, just trying to keep up with that. It's been really nice to have the hair sheep in addition to the cattle just because they do graze differently. Because there's some stuff that the hair sheep won't eat as well. Um, and so then it's nice to be able to bring the cattle in behind them and, and kind of clean that up and, and be able to go. But they do eat a lot more forbs, different forbs than the cattle will eat. So that part's been nice. One of the big benefits of native grasses, they're gonna be hardier and they're gonna be more adapted to our environment. You know, whether it's a lot of rain in the spring or super hot temperatures and high humidity in the summer. Um, you know, when you've got those native grasses, they're, they're adapted to that. Having some ground cover that provides shade down there for the soil, it doesn't dry out near as fast. You know, having that litter down on the bottom, it just helps insulate it. So it helps insulate it when it's cold and wet or cold. It helps insulate it when it's hot and dry. Um, you know, it's, it's got some shade. When it is hot and dry, we do try to leave a little bit taller grass as we graze through, um, just so we aren't drying out that topsoil as much. Even though we don't have nearly as much winter grazing as we would like to get to at this point, um, we still spend a lot less on winter hay than we would if we weren't doing this. Um, we have a lot better utilization of our grass all through this through the year. Um, and it, it, it's actually saved us a lot of money that we would have been spending in supplements and hay otherwise. So it's a trade-off. I mean, you can either spend time moving livestock or you can spend time haying. And with diesel prices the way they are now, I think I'd rather move a gate.